I'd love to welcome our fellow panelists to the stage. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time introducing anyone here. I'm Lynette Kiyoski with Fleet Canada. Um, and it's my pleasure to have with me today Chris Pollock from ECR Squared, Dikunmi Adiboy from Nigeria. Welcome, Dikunmi. Vincent Hodder from Local Logic here in Canada, and Wayne Berger from Smart Building. So, welcome to all of you for joining us today. Um, to really talk about sort of the startup. Uh, we have, uh, are we good? Good to go? Awesome. Uh, to talk about the top tech journey uh, in, in the context of uh, sustainability and really sort of how globalization uh, might be motivating or moving kind of that needle from um, a technology and innovation point of view. So with that, what I would love to do is just to start out with each of you introducing yourself, your solution. I really want to give you the opportunity uh, to do that however you like, uh, you know, in the way that you feel you can best uh, position your company, your solution, and sort of that problem you're solving. So uh, in no particular order, I'm just going to start and kind of go around uh, the direction that I see. So Chris, uh, would you start us off, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about EPR Squared and, and the solution you bring to market. Absolutely, thanks a lot, Lynette, and uh, thank you for uh, having me today. I'm excited to be able to talk with you all and uh, the audience a little bit about um, EPR Squared, or uh, Energy Producing Retail Realty. We are a, uh, a real estate development company focused on uh, developing a uh, asset class for clean tech. It's a real estate approach towards uh, developing energy rights on site. It uh, allows us to uh, develop essentially the same way real estate developers uh, focus on land development. So uh, from that perspective, we're an alternative to solar leases and PPAs and PACE financing here in the States. And we're looking to really accelerate the, uh, the deployment of clean tech on existing buildings in the built space. Awesome, thank you. Very good. Uh, Bikanmi, please tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your startup, Vamp FI or Vamp V. I can't remember how you pronounce it, but I'm gonna let you take that over. Yeah, it's called Vamp FI. Thank you very much, um, Lynette. Um, so Vampify is a startup that uses affordable technology to transform conventional buildings into smart buildings. And um, basically what we are doing in Nigeria is to convert, um, to use um, LoRaWAN technology. It's basically type um, some smaller devices that help us transmit data from, um, from critical asset equipment, such as generators or plant equipment. Um, elevators, um, HVAC systems, all of that. We are able to collect all of that data on performance and usage, and use that, uh, and use, and also use um, repair history, maintenance, maintenance history, and plant preventive maintenance history to build um, data, data points um, around um, how they how the assets are performing, how they should perform, what are the best assets to buy going forward in the long run. And obviously, um, also understanding um, basically the life cycle of the building um, using this data, um, using this data that we're collecting to, to really um, draw a point and also save costs for our customers and also put in line checks and transparency for, um, for um, operators and, um, and, maintenance, and maintenance heads and operation, operation managers to efficiently manage their buildings. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, can't wait to hear a little bit more about uh, about that solution and sort of some of the applications. Uh, Wayne, uh, please share with us a little bit more about Smart Building. Hi, Lynette. Thank you. So um, I'm actually the managing partner of Arshak Ventures, which is a prop tech venture builder. And one of our investments is a real estate digital twin called Smart Building. Smart Building is an app-based building management platform that digitizes and, and enables building communication, facilities management, IoT devices, utilities, assets, etc. Um, so we say from mobile app to management dashboard, we, we organize the building data to help manage better visualize, uh, help manage better visualize and utilize their real estate assets. Our clients include real estate funds, property managers, architects, uh, occupiers of space, and homeowners associations. 
From an impact perspective, just speaking to a few of our clients, um, the water and electrical data that uh, we share with them, we, we pull it through smart devices, and that helps them better understand um, the way they, they're engaging with the utilities and uh, how they are impacting the environment. And then from our preventive, preventative maintenance tool, um, we help against building deteriorate, deterioration, which is both a social and a financial benefit. And lastly, just speaking to a few um, property managers and architects, uh, they, they find that they're printing a lot, a, a lot less paper because we streamline and digitize all their different communication process, documents, handovers, et cetera. So that's just uh, a little intro on smart building. Excellent, thank you. And Wayne, just before um, we jump over to Vincent, can you uh, let our audience know where you're dialing in from today? So, oh yes, I'm dialing in from Johannesburg, South Africa. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, Vincent, um, obviously not the least, but the last <laughs> as an introduction. Uh, give us a little overview of Local Logic. Sure thing. Well, thanks, Lynette, and, and thanks for having me today. Um, sure. So I'm Vincent Cien, co-founder at Local Logic. Um, what we do at Local Logic is essentially try to quantify everything outside the four walls of an asset. So we believe that. Um, just like understanding the asset itself, understanding location is essential in understanding both the experiences that an asset can, can enable, but also understanding um, the behaviors and the patterns of movement that people are going to have based on where that asset is located. And so what we've done is for every single ad address in the U.S. and Canada, that's over 250 million addresses, we've essentially quantified everything that happens outside the four walls of those assets. So looking at things like access to transportation, access to shops and services, noise level, vibrancy, greenery, et cetera. And we distribute that knowledge through a series of APIs, uh, uh, a graphical user interface, so a platform you can log into, PDF reports that you can you can ping and, and will generate in a matter of minutes. Um, but what we also do is we help investors, developers, REITs, REITs, hedge funds, pension funds essentially understand where they should be investing, what risks they're exposed to, and what impacts their investments or their developments are going to have on the development of cities and neighborhoods in which they're present. And so our mission is really to help bring transparency to the real estate industry by giving a great understanding of the experiences that a location enables and helping our clients really optimize for profitability, but also for sustainability, making sure that they're building the right things for the right people in the right places. Very awesome. Thank you both. Thank you all for for. Such great and succinct uh, introductions. Um, we had we had such a great chat and a conversation, um, kind of when we met last week um, to go over this session. And you know, I think we have a lot of ground that we could cover here. But I just want to sort of take a moment um, and circle back to you know the overview of this particular event, which is really the social impact of. Uh, I don't want to get this title right. The social impact of prop tech, and so. Um, you know, Thomas and Thano just sort of wrapped up the previous session talking quite a bit around, you know, data and sort of how that is likely going to be the driver into the future. And, you know, through each of the all of your introductions this morning, uh, I think clearly that's a central driving point or a central component of all of your solutions in terms of of what your um you know, the impact that you are bringing to market. So, you know, Vincent, I'd love to just maybe have you start off here. And uh, because I think you teed this up really nicely um, in the context of the data outside the four walls. And clearly Thomas and, and Thana were talking about the data inside the four walls. But really uh, what I would love to hear from all of you is, you know, even though this may be where you are today, what was sort of that, compelling factor in the marketplace that spurred you on to build what you now have or what was the problem you were originally trying to solve and how was that kind of what's that journey been like to this point so you know Vincent if you didn't wouldn't mind kind of taking a, the first crack at that and uh and we'll move on from there Sure. Well, I think I think data, a lot of people are speaking about data and how data is going to revolutionize things and revolutionize the way people make decisions. But I think ultimately, you know, in speaking with our customers, nobody comes to us and says, hey, I want more data. Right. Everybody has a ton of data. What they want is they want answers to their questions. 
Um, and so they want something that's going to be actionable. And I think the, the, the biggest challenge to any kind of data provider or technology solution is how do you make sure to um, build a product that will add insights, add value to your customer, but also meet the industry where they are today, right? Which is a very tricky thing where you're trying to innovate, but at the same time, you need to fit within their processes, their decision-making principles and influence that and change that over time. And so kind of when we, when we first came to market, um, we're a team of urban planners turned data scientists working in real estate, right? So we have a pretty unique perspective to this market. And for us, what was very clear is saying, well, I think the industry has a responsibility of understanding the impacts of their investments, of what they're going to be building on the communities that we all get to live in afterwards. And for me, um, it was very important that we, we enabled um, our customers in the real estate industry to really take better decisions that took that into context. Yet no one wants to know kind of what's the setback or what's the sense of enclosure for a specific asset or kind of what that specific asset has in terms of where it is in its development cycle. What they want to know is, is this going to be a good investment? Am I exposing myself to specific risks? Am I going to be able to differentiate myself from the competition or whatever other specific question they may have? And so I think as a startup, um, you need to bring this unique perspective, this unique point of innovation, but then adapt it to the realities of the market and make sure to speak the same language as your customers, but also understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to accomplish. And then you can go and innovate with them as you're bringing that, 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 that a product to market. I don't know if that answers your question, Lynette, but, but I think for me, it's really important that, that startups understand that um, if their technology is going to be adopted. Yeah. And, you know, th thank you for actually taking us down that path, because I think, you know, that door swings both ways. Right. So startups need to understand that. And again, just sort of thinking back to, you know, the previous panel, I think the common language component is so important from even the customer base as well. Right. And so, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What are the solutions that you need that I can help bring to market for you? And to your point, getting really clear on sort of what the status quo of today is and what that kind of desired future looks like kind of collaboratively and collectively so that innovation can happen and, and flow through. So I thank you for, for sort of weaving that out that way. Uh, Vikundi, I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective. Um, you know, I want to hear a little bit more about, you know, where Vampify originated, what solution, you know, you were bringing to market and kind of how the marketplace has adopted and how the product has evolved to where you are today. Um, thank you for that question. It's a very viable question. Um, uh, Vampify stemmed from um, stemmed from a parent company, a parent company called Film of Facilities Management. Um, um, it's a 25 year old company um, that specializes in real estate services, facility management, and real estate consultancy when it comes to um, building out in-house facility management departments. Um, so Vampify, um, as a result of constantly using manual processes and um, an off-the-shelf software and trying to manage our operations, um, none of them were actually built for a, um, were built for um, an extensive transparency level that would require in Nigeria. Um, obviously, there's some things here and there that need to be, that they need to be clearer Let's be clear when it comes to operating here, um, such as prices, who and who are doing work and whatnot. So we're able to build out a process management solution. That was the first version of Vampify. Uh, for us to know when um, preventive maintenance would happen, for us to know when um, things like reactive, um, reactive maintenance, um, tracking reactive maintenance using um, a systemic um, service level agreement and all of that. So that's where vampify stemmed from and we realized that um, bms systems um regular bms um, bms solutions or bm solutions um cost a lot more in nigeria because it means that you have to use big names such as honeywell or um or or simmons or schneider or what the case may be so i mean we started exploring doing some research what we could do to actually mirror some of the solutions um things like that that are niche to nigeria or niche to Africa, such as power issues, 
managing water, managing uh, managing um, HVAC systems as well. So what we decided to do was to start looking at how we could design some of our IETs. Um, we had we had some guys in in France that helped us build that out. Um, where we looked at uh, where we looked at how we could um, measure and obviously um, start to collect data on um, on, on some of this um, some of these issues as generate diesel management um, diesel management and and um, and what as well so from there we realized that other customers needed this uh, other customers started asking us okay find that off the sales solutions cost way too much and how much um, how much can be how much can we provide our solutions so we decided that you know that we can actually undercut the market by actually bringing out by using simple solutions wireless solutions to measure critical things that are essential in the building and scale up from there um scale up i mean that we can scale up to start measuring um start measuring other other parts of the building but for now we're sticking to some parts um such as um these secrets and surveillance people counting um, um water consumption um power in utilities and obviously vetting of power as well. Uh, so uh, we are we are currently really centered around those um, those particular areas for now, so that we can scale up to um, to more um, um, to more te uh, to more technical um, heavy things. Um, right now, because we're still in landscape in Nigeria, we're still very very rudimentary when it comes to um, BM solutions at at a very democratic level. Um, right now, we're still for the high rises and um high rises and um, newer buildings that are built specifically to um, have um, high-tech solutions so where we are looking now is to convert those buildings using um lower one technology which are simple um, simple devices that we can use to measure these things and, actually, and, and control some of these elements and use this um, use this in a way to not only bring down the cost of installing of installing bm systems but also make it a lot easier um, because most times BM systems here are, not, are actually an afterthought as opposed to being a pre-design um, pre issue. So we are keen in, we are keen into pre-design and also keen into after design as well. So that way we are a lot more flexible in the way we are um, looking to deploy our solutions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. And I, I, what's, what was, what's so interesting to me about this panel is, you know, this truly is a global a global representation of how prop tech's being applied in you know for very regional specific issues and yet there's similar challenges maybe just with some different input factors and different variables and so you know i think even in terms of you know some of the regional issues that you're facing become me you know the technology obviously is transferable and you know and one of the things that you know, sort of the tenants that we lean on, you know, at reach is, you know, technology really has no borders. And so you can certainly see application, um, you know, really anywhere with some slight, some slight adjustments in the context of, of what your target focus is or what your objective is. So thank you for that. Wayne, I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, a little bit more about the evolution of smart building and in particular because your structure is a little bit different too, sort of as, um, you know, in terms of how you've come to market. So can you maybe share with us uh, a bit more about sort of the evolution of smart building, um, you know, how that evolved through the ecosystem that you represent and sort of how you're bringing that to market and scaling? Sure. So to, to, understand um, how we got you um, just to give you a bit of a background I, I founded a digital transformation consultancy in 2005 it, it, it actually started off as a software development house and later became a consultancy um, we realized that we could actually assist our clients more before they kicked off a project rather than actually building the project for them and what happened uh, um, we, we evolved into just picking up a lot of financial uh, institutions as clients and um, let's say real estate funds as clients. And we, we couldn't believe how much money was, was spent or wasted on failed technology implementations. And um, we just, it, it's really, for us, it was horrific. So what we looked at, we have these very technical resources in-house, um, very, very, um, let's say, knowledgeable um, techies and uh, what we started to do is uh, 
we would look to say, okay, where, where is there a solution that someone in, in a specific industry, specifically prop tech or, or in the fintech space where there was a requirement? And then we would go build a technology to be 90% there and then focus on the last 10% to, let's say, customize for the client's needs. As uh, Vincent was also mentioning earlier, there's a little bit of customization. And we also build to white label, meaning that we can brand it for different clients. So we really got into the space um, out of first uh, identifying redundancies in the markets and then also just seeing how our clients are struggling um, they generally go through a pattern of first building themselves realizing that that's not what they want to do then in the south african market um, what happens is they they'll do lots of meetings and then they would look at what is the biggest um, solution internationally and or they would go to a big consulting firm and then they'll go you know hire a consulting firm do a year of research and then they'll go for one of the big solutions only for a year later after that to scrap the project so this was a, a trend that we were seeing far too often and um, yeah so we and that was sort of how we evolved because uh, our whole thing was to be you know in the tech space you've got to fail fast so we we can get them live quickly and um, if it's not working they can fail quickly as opposed to one big failure so, so that's how, how we got to this position. Thank you. And I saw, you know, as you were sort of sharing your story there, I saw a lot of nodding from Chris behind <laughs> me. And, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's one of the more common experiences, you know, in the context of bringing technology to market is, you know, it's not just whether the solution is the right one. And it, it's really the environment and the willingness and, you know, sort of you've all touched on this as well, the partnerships that you can lean on that really help it evolve. And um, I, I do want to get into a little bit more of that conversation because it was um, it was one that was, I think there was a lot of energy around in our prep call. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those challenges. But before we get there, uh, Chris, I know that, you know, when you brought EPR Squared to the market, there were some really sort of big I, big goals that you had in terms of what you were seeing and opportunities that you saw in the marketplace so can you just share a little bit more about kind of that you know that journey that you have gone uh through to to evolve you know sort of the focus on energy property rights and you know what how that how that came to be yeah, absolutely. Thank you for uh, for that lead in. I mean, uh, to be quite frank, we've been working on this for so long. I have to take a second to step back about my origin story. You know, prop tech is a very uh, uh, patient driven and deliberate uh, approach to uh, to VC. I think a lot of us who are shaking our heads, uh, looking at talking with property owners and, and even talking about, hey, we want to fail fast. Property owners are like, you want to fail? What? <laughs> you know, it's like just a completely different mindset. And so kind of our, I think, collective groups and, and our company specifically is kind of at that intersection of real estate, finance, and energy. And, you know, looking at it from the lens of prop tech and seeing how we are really uh, on the ground level of social impact and ESG and sustainability and net zero. I mean, you know, our, our moniker, our, our one liner that we always share with the market is that, you know, real estate owners, along with the real estate industries, hold the keys to positively impacting our economy and our environment, both locally and globally. And I mean, that line in and of itself encompasses exactly where real estate fits in how we're going to change the world, how we're going to be able to uh, do the carbon offsets that we need to, to essentially keep the, uh, you know, the temperature down in, in order for us not to have these huge weather events. And, you know, whether or not you believe in the 100% impact of, you know, humans on climate change, the reality is that from a location perspective, from a building management perspective, real estate is going to be impacted by the environment. It is impacting the environment and it's up to us to really figure out a way to drive innovation and to get energy generated on site that's clean and renewable and that we're doing operations that are being tracked and managed and that are being um, accepted by the community as either a carbon offset or carbon capture. And, you know, from that standpoint, our origin story began, you know, back in the great financial crisis, right? When buildings were about to go under underwater, the entire world was coming to an end. And I was working in the real estate finance kind of private equity investment, you know, advising realm, trying to figure out how do we protect these buildings? How do we make these buildings last and, and survive this 
you know, great financial crisis. And part of it was that if we install existing technologies that are available commercially today, we can literally change whether or not a building is underwater or not from a financial perspective on the margin. The problem is, is that there's really no structure that enables property owners to do so that aligns the interests. And that's a, a lot of the uh, conversation that we were having earlier and what you touched upon previously in Lynette was that the stakeholder interest, the property owners, the tenants, the investors, the project level investors, the technology developers, right? They all have different and varied interests. And if we don't align those, then it'll never really get deployed. And in commercial real estate, if it doesn't have a, a simple way of deployment, you know, property owners will just say, hey, listen, you know, give me a year or two. You know, it's a deflationary d dilemma. It'll be cheaper and better in a year anyway. We'll, we'll figure it out then. Unfortunately, you know, you can kick the can down the road e eternally, basically. So uh, what we're really hoping to is to short circuit that decision making and say, hey, listen, we'll pay you to go put clean energy on your property in a real estate approach, aligning all the interests and providing you clean power at a discount on site without subsidies, without incentives. So what's your what's your hesitation? What's the holdback, right? So hopefully, uh, you know, we're getting a little traction here in California and, you know, talking to, to uh, my fellow colleagues on the pan, you know, panelists here uh, from South Africa and from Canada and from all over the world, you know, problems are borderless. You know, ESG, sustainability, net zero, these problems are are all of ours. And, you know, collectively, we're, we're dealing with the same problems on the micro level. So I'm hoping that collectively we'll be able to solve it on the macro level. Awesome. Thank you. You know, what I love about this panel is you guys make my job really, really easy because you really, you really you provide softballs for me. Just lob them out there so that we can carry the conversation on. And so on that note, and this is where, you know, there was so much energy in the prep call is, you know, I know one of the one of the organizers did want us to kind of go down this path of, you know, bringing technology to market. How do you come to market? How do you scale? But you can't have that conversation without talking about both sides of that coin. It's both the problems and the alignment throughout the ecosystem in terms of addressing the problems. And so, you know, I, I'd love maybe uh, Vince for you to lean in here and talk a little bit about or sh or share your perspective a little bit here on you know what local logic has done to align those interests um you know in the context of bringing the right parties to the table to identify what the challenges are um you know and then i, I also want to shift to one of the one of the points that you had made in our prep conversation around what are the motivating factors because while social impact and sustainability and esg are all great they're not the things that necessarily drive the decisions through the ecosystem for all for all parties. So, yeah. you know, I'd love to give you the opportunity to, to address that. For sure. For sure. And I think Chris kind of touched on it just now. But, you know, ultimately, I think, like I said earlier, the real estate industry has this responsibility to actually do good, right? Uh, like it or not, private sector and real estate are actually the ones building our cities. They're the ones building the neighborhoods, the communities that we all get to live in. And the reality is that the decisions that they make will have huge impacts on the types of environments that are built, the types of lifestyles that that enables, and also on the decisions that will be forced on us in terms of the way we move around cities, the sustainability of those of those communities, um, be it at the building level or the community level. And so I think the industry totally understands this. They, 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 they take that on that responsibility. They realize the potential that their industry has. They realize the um, um, really the, the, the potential of really shifting major, major things um, in, in the way we live. Yet at the same time, they have tremendous financial pressure and an economic reality that needs, that forces them to take decisions or to prioritize certain things. Um, I do think there's great technological advances that are coming. There's new systems, there's, there's more data, there's more hardware that enables us to reduce costs, to improve the way that decisions are made, to improve the way that buildings are managed. Um, but the reality is that those technologies are gonna be adopted if it makes financial sense. And on top of it, um, if there is a sustainability or an ESG bonus to it, that's great. Now, we can argue that with additional regulation, with new policies being enacted, that's going to change. And there's going to be much more pressure to adopt those technologies. But 
the reality is that as a startup, as um, a, a, an innovator or kind of a disruptor in that space, you need to make sure that your solution aligns both the sustainability or ESG piece with the profitability piece. And so our approach has always been that we're going to come in here and actually align with your business model and make sure that we are creating a solution that will um, affect your bottom line positively. And on top of it, we will help you then demonstrate the, Im the positive impact that you have on society, on sustainability by implementing those services. It's very much a bonus, right? Even if our motivation as a company is to actually uh, enact that change in the world, we know that we need to, we need to, we need to demonstrate a clear ROI of using your solutions. And so I think the way we do that is really by, um, you know, launching new products or innovating with partners. So we do what we call model market fit, where we bring a tremendous amount of unique and proprietary data on both what's there in our cities, but also how a demand is actually impacting um, uh, the, the specific location characteristics that are in demand today. So we have about 10 million unique users a month interacting with our solutions, which gives us this uh, leading indicator to demand for real estate. So we understand what people care about, what people want in terms of location characteristics at an address by address level throughout the US and Canada, right? So we, we bring a tremendous amount of unique and proprietary data and insights to the table, but then we align with our specific clients and saying, well, what are your investment ob objectives? What is your investment thesis? What are you trying to accomplish? What is your strategy? And then what we do is we actually help them along with our products um, to actually accomplish in those strategies. And then we help them actually measure the impact that they have. And so they're in control of what they're trying to accomplish. And we're coming in here and assisting and augmenting what they do with technology. But it's very clear to us that um, their ROI of why they would invest in our solution needs to make since day one. So I think that's how we're approaching it. I think with, with additional policy and regulation around ESG reporting metrics and kind of understanding exactly what goes into it, there's going to be additional pressure um, for certain kind of, um, kind of late adopters of technology to be moved in that direction. But I don't think we have to wait because I think, you know, to Chris's point, it makes financial sense today, and we might as well go and go to market um, with that technology today. Yeah, it's the carrot and stick, right? And and there's the stick, obviously, that's forming in the in the in the uh, in the the regulatory world, right? Where the investors and the insurance companies and all the financial institutions are saying, "You've got to do this. It's fiduciary. It's ESG. It's net zero. It's sustainability." And at the end of the day, property owners are like, "Yes, we hear you. We hear you. We hear you." However. A lot of these things are are kind of like the winds of change, right? They're here one day, gone the other. So they're trying to look at it from their you know real estate perspective of 20, 30 year hold periods where they're making a deliberate in you know micro infrastructure investment, right? I mean, they have other investments on site that they could be making to increase the revenues and, and perform their fiduciary duties. So we really, you know, as a prop tech uh, group focused on clean tech, have to be very sensitive to that and make it so that property owners see that we are looking at their properties from their same per point of view, right? Like, Hey, we're not just here going to sell you something and you're, we're going to be gone in 18 months because you know what? We failed too quickly. Right. I mean, no property it, wants to deal with that. So. It, and I think I'd add one thing, Chris, like to Wayne's point of, I think implementation of new technology is, is on, is on the company, is on the technology company, right? We need to make it really, really easy from both an ROI and business use case point of view, but also from a, um, an implementation point of view. Um, it shouldn't take you six months to onboard a new technology, right? If you're with the right partner, it's easy, it makes sense. And that company or that tech partner has already done the legwork of understanding how it's gonna embed itself in the existing workflow um, that you have as a real estate company. And so I think the reality is that as prop tech matures as an industry, as we have new companies coming in, and as we understand the real pain points and where the industry is today, we're gonna to be developing solutions that make financial sense day one, but also that have a low cost of implementation. Um, and, and maybe we don't use the fail quickly analogy with those customers, but rather saying, hey, day one, you're gonna get value out of it. And that's our mission, that's what we're trying to do. And then if you wanna come and innovate and, and build new products and kind of go the next mile, you can become a development partner for those technologies. But the reality is that 
it's it's on the company to make it really easy to buy, really easy to use, and have real financial returns. I, I thank you for that, both of you, because I think you know you've kind of really encom- encapsulated really what the crux of this is, right? You're the reason for innovation is to drive value forward into the marketplace. And, um, you know, kudos for sort of taking on the ownership component of that, because I think often, at least in the work that we do with technology startups, um, it is flipped on its head, right? Where there's sort of an expectation that I will build it and they will come um, and then we'll figure out what the value proposition is going forward. And that seems to be the the least um, least likely path to success for a lot of technology companies because it leaves everybody sort of in that gap period to your point Vince you know the six month implementation period so um, I I think super critical I want to just sort of maybe draw this thread out a little bit more though in the context of you know responsibility and um, you know who has you know what the challenges are who has the responsibility for overcoming those challenges and in one of the things that we talked about, and I'm going to toss this over to Wayne and Bakunmi because it was really apparent um, from an African perspective, you know, some of those challenges that are maybe a little bit outside of the control of either the startup or the asset owner or the industry. And we were talking a little bit about, you know, infrastructure challenges and how the things that you kind of take for granted or things that even, you know, used to be great infrastructure have either you know, deteriorated over time and not been maintained or infrastructure hasn't continued to develop. So, you know, Becoming and Wayne, can you share some of those challenges? Um, And I'm not sure which one of you wants to go first, but I know you have slightly different perspectives from your respective sides of of the continent. I think I'll speak speak on two things. Um, The first thing is technology adoption. Uh, I will speak on what, uh, I'll just refer to what Vincent mentioned about onboarding. Um, onboarding is a very, very key part of, obviously, of we're using your technology. And I would say that onboarding is kind of a challenge here as well, because um, you, are, you, are presenting, you are presenting a new solution that is supposed to be transparent, right, at the management level. So they understand, okay, fine, this will do this for us. We'll have more insights to how much diesel we're consuming. We'll have more insights to how much people are actually spending on fixing bulbs or or repairing acs or fixing heaters and whatnot so at the management level you have that correct right you have that correct where it understands the value of your understanding of you onboarding your product then you have at the user level there is a problem it's particularly in um, in nigeria i don't know about the rest of the world but particularly in nigeria is where people already have a way of operating right that are that is usually not really transparent but kind of present a different kind of value to them, right? So our value, our presenting our value is um, it is us fixing the problems that address the entire organization. But the user value, the user value might be different, slightly different. User values are usually um, are usually financial gains, sometimes financial gains. I'm not bashing the entirety of Nigerian users. But a a lot of Nigerians, a lot of Nigerians within this space kind of are not essentially transparent when it comes to, uh, when it comes to how they operate. So our solution is bringing a broader insight and broader transparency into how how they operate. And it kind of like, it kind of like clashes with how they want to, with how they see us or how they want to use our product. Because um, oftentimes you might say, might tell you that, um, this might expose some certain things that are happening and whatnot. So you might start seeing some pushback at the at the um, middle management level, just so that we um, if pushback minimal at middle management level, and we are not able to um, fully onboard um, onboard our product. But sometimes, I mean, that happens. That's one of the that's just one um, one use case, and not necessarily for all of our all of our other customers. Um, I mean, a lot of the other challenges are just um, understanding um, um, best practices. Um, one of the first few things that we have to do when we go into any of our new customers is to um, fully understand their process and how they, um, from end to end, um, their request process, their closing out, closing out of jobs process and whatnot. Usually our, our designs, our entire design is flexible in a way where we can actually just um, um, jog around the permissions to ensure that everybody's still able to be transparent and work more efficiently. Um, 
but that you see that sometimes some some um, some um, processes are usually conjoined and the users are usually overwhelmed because the organization themselves do not really see how um, how they don't really place value on staffing and so our product kind of exposes that as well and not only that it takes a longer time for them to actually get someone to use that part of the of the solution or we have to break some things down to let them use which also increases onboarding time as well um so those are the kind of those are the things that we experience in onboarding and obviously it's also a culture shift from you using a manual process uh manual processing doing things and a lot of these companies that we're trying to work with are usually startups uh, management startup or real estate startups that actually come up as well or have a few customers that are working with or they're managing a couple buildings and they want to um, use our solutions to manage those buildings properly but um I, I mean like i said before one of the one of the challenges that we face is that culture shift is that why do i have to press this why do i have to do this why do i have to um constantly why do i have to constantly ensure that uh I'm connected to the internet. So, so all those kinds of things are very, very, uh, are still at a micro level, they are, um, um, they are, they're not that of much of a problem, but when they are added up, it becomes um, a wider problem of just trying to ensure that you're able to push to more customers and more customers. Um, yeah, so um, those are the two challenges that we that we face. And obviously trying lack of transparency when it comes to procuring materials um, from, from the markets, uh, I mean, we are very, we, we collect a lot of data when it comes to uh, material purchases and stuff like that. We are also, we are also like a data bank for our customers to just quickly benchmark things and whatnot. So we constantly have to like vet materials to ensure that these materials are not reoccurring or they're the right price and stuff like that. So um, I think for us is more of a transparency problem from the, uh, from the user point of view um, than, um, than um than us particularly trying to um trying to build solutions around them we, we get enough feedback on how we are um how the solution should work or what you think things that we should change we are fast we are very nimble in iterating quickly so we don't really we don't really have problems in fixing issues or uh, trying to or trying to um or trying to redesign to um to fit our, our clients need but I think it's a wider problem in the real estate space mm -hmm. in, in Africa and Nigeria, where um, it's not really, it's not tech, it's not, I mean, it's inevitable that technology will take over, but it's going at a very, very slow pace. Right. So, so more and, of a cultural, maybe more of a cultural yes. kind of barrier. Cultural challenge. issue, cultural issue, okay. transparency issue, and just a lot of moving parts, not understanding, um, not understanding that the value that the value that there's more value in trying in actually building um, a straight line process than just having to right. do that over there. So, right. I mean, those are the basic challenges that we have. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bukami. And and I just want to be conscious of time here. Uh, I know we started a little bit late, but we want to try and keep uh, keep the event uh, running running close to time. So, Wayne. Um, would love for you to share maybe some of the challenges that yeah. you were letting us know that you're facing um, over down there in, in uh, Joburg. So, so a quick political history on on uh, South Africa. We had um, under our ex president uh, President Zuma, we had something called state capture. A lot of state infrastructure had decayed. There was uh, no maintenance really done on. Uh, certain infrastructure and now we're sort of riddled well not sort of we are riddled with load shedding which is a big problem um it's something that we re really didn't have historically and it's it's a problem in, in south africa so um generators and other alternative um energy um sources are are you know being considered and on that note what i have next to me i've got a um a, a sheet from the sapoa which is the south african property association and they've introduced something called an energy performance certificate. So Chris was talking about the stick in this uh, particular space. I'm just going to read the, the top. It, it says EPCs will promote energy consciousness with your business operations, as well as energy and en energy efficiency culture. And then um, I just went to look at the, the, the page of the fines and fines can be up to about $330,000. So that's just um, one area they've, they've defined over here. Real um, 
at, at Israel risk and there is a real issue. And there's also something called the Green Building Council that's been around for a while in South Africa, but that was more like a half five, you're doing well. This is uh, if you don't get your ducks in a row, you're gonna be um, you're gonna be fine. So so those are just two things that are happening in South Africa currently. And what that means really to the landlords is that now they're saying, okay, what information do I currently have on my buildings? What information do I currently need to to acquire? Yeah. Because really you need that feedback loop. Um, you need to be able to. Right now you can have a building, but you don't have all the data in in a way that you can get the feedback and use it constructively. The situation with how Africa is developing and how the West is developing in terms of clean tech and prop tech is very fascinating. I mean, we, we spoke previously about how there's a, a leapfrog opportunity for prop tech and clean tech on the African continent. Yeah. And in the United States, we're kind of looking at it as almost like a canary in the coal mine situation, especially here in California, where, you know, one of the largest, you know, economies in the world and we're having more and more blackouts and this is something where you know wayne is saying we never we never had blackouts in south africa now all of a sudden we have them and Bukumi is saying you know well we've always had infrastructure issues this every is day. You know, <laughs> every the, day in the day to day we are literally but so i mean what we mentioned just now is exactly what we're going through um there's a huge state capture going on with our um, infrastructure when it comes to electricity as well um, electricity here is is more or less an afterthought. Um, when it comes to when it comes to actual our grid, is an afterthought. Um, I mean, a lot more a lot more organizations have to power themselves. And like I said last in our last um, in our last meeting, um, the cost of of, um, of powering yourself now has gone up about three hundred percent. All the oils and maintaining your generators, your diesel itself has gone up three hundred percent. Um, the actual the actual parts have gone up as well. So there is a huge there is a huge opportunity opportunity for clean affordable tech, um, um, electricity and power here. And also there is there is we <laughs> you are more or less fighting against the generator companies. Generator companies have a foothold in power generating infrastructure. They they have minimum min, um, they have plants where they supply to some certain areas and whatnot. So there is a huge battle in trying to get things done here. Awesome. But and I think just just to maybe add one thing here, I think a lot of people see both climate risk and transition as a risk, right? Like transitioning from a traditional way of doing things to this new way of doing things that is going to be more conscious of the climate. But for me, it's a transition opportunity. Right. And I think technology and these new innovative products are going to open up a new way of doing business. And um, there's such great opportunity in revolutionizing your own business and the way you're seeing the market, because with great changes comes great opportunities. And, and, and I'd love for us to start calling it a transition opportunity rather than transition risk in climate. It I, that's such a great, such a great point, Vince. And, you know, again, just conscious of time here in the last two minutes, I'd love to just go around the horn real quick. And from each of your perspectives, I'd love to hear kind of where you see the biggest opportunity for either your solution or this space or the real estate sector to innovate on exactly that point. Because I think that is, especially in this arena, it is always evaluated on risk, right? The transition, like it's either risk of not doing something or risk of doing the wrong thing that perpetuates the problem we're trying to address. And so flipping that on its head to your point, Vince, uh, maybe you just kick us off real quick and I'll go around the circle in, in two minutes here uh, and just hear from you where you think there is the greatest opportunity. Well, I'm biased, right? So our whole thing is about saying, what is the impact of the commercial real estate industry on the way that cities are developed? And for me, what we're seeing is such a tremendous opportunity to build more sustainable and resilient communities if we just consider the impact of those investments and those development decisions. Um, if you transform a traditional kind of strip mall asset into a mixed use community, you've just changed up the whole makeup of that area. Um, what you know used to be a car dependent asset well, now is something that could be, you know, you could walk to your grocery store, you can actually have access to your day to day needs through active transportation. Um, when we think about sustainability and kind of changing the habits of people, I think real estate has such a tremendous impact. And so for me, what's exciting is that we're seeing more and more funds, more and more investors and developers really understand that potential, grasp onto it. 
and understand that making the right sustainable decision is oftentimes the right business decisions because yeah. sustainable assets are good for business. Yeah, love it. Thank you. But Kanye, real quick, I know you kind of mentioned, um, you know, the opportunity just in your brief, in your comments at the very yeah. end there. But anything you wanted so, to add? Yeah. So briefly, we understand we understand at Vampify that technology transition is very very inevitable but we want to be part of that process as well, majorly part of that process. So where we see ourselves in the future is, is to be able to um, um, provide affordable um, affordable facility management across Africa um, without having, without having, um, without having to have a physical office or anything, right? Once we're able to say, you know, we're able to, uh, we're able to recommend the best, um, the best artisans, the best uh, facility companies to work for you and obviously maintain your building and obviously provide you insights on that building. Um, that we once once we are once we're able to change the culture of, of FM of or, or facilities management or management just being a luxury, we want that to be more of a thing that is um, that is a necessity as opposed to being a luxury. So once we can do that, we're sure that we are we are here um, our our goal. Amazing. Thank you so much, Wayne. Yeah, I mean, just to to add, I, I, I don't think adopting um, technology is that complicated. I think it's it's cultural, and you should take the first baby step. You don't have to take the biggest leap, and I think that's what what guys get wrong often. And from a more technical perspective, uh, something that we built into smart building is that we're very strong with API integration. That's connecting to systems and. We find that you know certain clients will be dedicated to their accounting software or loyal to some sort of software, and I think it's very important to have a solution that is easy integrated, um, and ideally to have one dashboard, and that's really what we focus on. So we think that you have to take the first baby step, and I think you need to have one dashboard to look at all your info. Simple, the old Kiss principle: just keep it simple and um, and take the first step. I, I love it. Chris, uh, bring us home. Where do you see the biggest opportunity? Absolutely. And uh, going in line with uh, what everybody's been saying, yes, we definitely need to take a baby step forward and doing the small incremental improvements that can scale is really how we're going to shift the direction of an entire industry path bending versus, you know, complete, you know, step changes. So from that standpoint, from, you know, our point of view, the next energy transition is really the greatest opportunity of the century. I mean, 7.5 gigatons is the number of carbon offsets required in order to get us net zero. That means we need to go develop 7.5 million one megawatt solar projects on real estate. So 60,000 square feet of space. We need 7.5 million of those and we're net zero. I'm not talking about the real estate industry taking care of its own 40% of the carbon offsets. I'm talking about taking care of the world's offsets. We go do $7.5 million, one megawatt projects, and we're done. Let's go. Greatest opportunity, there it is, one step at a time. You've got a project, you've got a one megawatt solar facility. That's a you know one megawatt carbon offset. We need 7.5 million of them. We got to get it done. Well, I think in terms of the audience um, that the building transformations folks have, um, that shouldn't be a problem. Everybody should just go home and turn that turn that project on, and there we go. Amazing. Thank you all so much, Chris Bukhanmi, Wayne, Vince. Really appreciate your insights. I feel like uh, this panel could have gone on forever and we could have taken some really interesting uh, turns in the conversation, but um, very much appreciate all of the wisdom and expertise you've shared. Best of luck to all of you as you continue to scale your solutions, not just into the, um, into the social, into providing the social impact, but um, to being those viable, profitable, um, really well ROI turning investments that they are. So thank you all. Really appreciate your time today. Thank Thanks, Lynette. Take care.